Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am here to do the review for ITC exam two, your final exam. This covers the modules six, seven, eight, and nine, and is all internet stuff um, and email, which is also an internet thing. So let's go through it. Hopefully, you've already watched the lectures and you've seen the intro to um, internet, intro to cybersecurity, the little email tour. Um, and you're all ready to go. So just like last week, I have put these slides together in the order of your study guide so that we can go through. And if you have anything outstanding in the study guide, you can fill it in now. We will chat as a group afterwards. So make sure you fill it all in and then come on in to the review meeting um, and I'll take your questions and we'll talk about things in more detail. Alrighty. So the first well, the whole thing is intro to the internet. Technically, it's split up into internet history, um, internet services, um, email, and then internet security, but it's all kind of blended together. So, alrighty. First question, how many computers are needed to create a network? Just two, just two. Only, that's it, <laughs> just two. You only need two. Okay, here we go. When a single server connects multiple computers, what type of network is formed? So remember your server is your host. Um, so it's your client server network. The clients are the ones requesting service. When the internet was new, who were its main users? Well, we know that the general public was not allowed to access the internet um, and just kind of couldn't access the internet. It wasn't a thing for them to access until the 90s. So it definitely wasn't the general public. Major banks and retailers also would not have been involved in the internet at the beginning because it wasn't encrypted and it wouldn't have been useful for them, um, but it wasn't encrypted. It wasn't secure to send financial things. Programmers at Microsoft, Microsoft didn't exist. So it's military and defense contractors. Okay. The military is kind of always the people that use technology first because they're the ones who have the budget to invest in the research. Okay, which type of modem allows you to use the internet and the phone at the same time? And so I'm talking about a landline phone, right? One that's plugged into a wall. So if you remember back in the day, there'd be a dial up, right? Which is sending super high frequencies and screaming at you. Um, you've got cable, meaning you literally plug her in to something, uh, satellites, you know, no, it's not that. It's DSL. So DSL stands for digital subscriber line. And it is the modem that allows you to access the internet, right? Without interrupting the phone. And it does this just by being a different type of wire, really. It's got copper and things in them. Um, but essentially, digital subscriber line or DSL, this is the type of modem most people have. So you plug it into a phone jack and the wall, um, but it doesn't actually use the phone line, just uses the network. So digital subscriber line. What protocol does the internet use? So remember protocols is the rules um, for how things are gonna be formatted. You can kind of think about this as language where you know if we all speak it in the same way, we can all understand it together. And by we, I mean the computers. So the protocol that the internet uses is called TCP IP, which stands for Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol. And basically, it's the rules for what your packet looks like. Um, so remember, your packet is the info you're sending. So it's the control for how to format that packet so that the other computers can understand it. What are the two most used internet services? So you'll remember from the uh, quiz study guide and discussion that the web is the most popular internet service. So it's got to be one of these answers that has the web in it. Okay, so we either have the web and email or the web and FTP. FTP is file transfer protocols, um, sending files to each other through that. That's not the most popular service. It's email. So the web is the most popular and email is the second most popular. Keep in mind that the web and the internet are not synonyms. They are different things. The web is the content and the internet is the connection, the energy, the structure, the infrastructure. And then the web is, you know, the websites that you look at, okay? So from the quizzes, the web is number one and then email. 
how do you open an application on Windows 10? You double click on it or you select it from the start menu. Um, I don't think I need to go into any more detail there. People know how to do this. You double click on an icon or find it in your menu. If you're on a Mac, you find it in your finder. What does URL stand for and what is it? Well, big uh, trick here. You're gonna find the one that actually makes URL instead of some other letter. So it's a uniform resource locator. And what does that mean? Uniform means it's always the same. Resource locator means it's finding the source or the resource on the web. So it's the address of a piece of content on the web, whether that's a website or a file. So uniform resource locator, URL. How do you use one? You're going to put it into the address box because it's the address. So you're going to put it in the address box and it's going to take you there. Okay. And remember from the uh, intro to the internet lecture, the structure of the URL and how that works as far as telling you or telling the computer where to go and what to find and these you know subdirectories so have a look at that if you need more info but you're just entering it in the address box for it to work the three types of links accessible on websites um, this is text links so text written things words um, which are usually underlined or in a different color and you have image links and image map links. And remember an image map just means that um, it's one graphic, but different parts of the graphic are linked to different things. Okay, so text links, image and image map. In your browser, how do you organize your shortcuts? Um, first of all, what is your shortcut? Um, <laughs> you put them in folders is what you do. You uh, organize your shortcuts by putting them in folders and your shortcuts are your favorites and your bookmarks, um, depending on which browser you're using, but you organize them in folders just like you'd organize anything else really. Google, Bing, Yahoo, et cetera, are examples of what? They are search engines, not browsers. Google Chrome is a browser. Bing comes with Microsoft Edge, which is a browser. Yahoo does not have a browser of its own, but you know, so you can use any search engine with any browser. So these are search engines. Okay. Press the button again. How can you search the web for an exact phrase? So this is a punctuation thing. You're going to put quotation marks around the phrase um, so that it is read as one search unit as opposed to all those individual words being separate queries and being found in different places on the site. You want those words to be found together on the site, so you put them in quotations. When searching the internet, will you get the same results no matter what engine you use? No, no you won't. Um, so remember, every engine is going to give you different results because they have different databases and different algorithms for what to display to you. And, you know, due to your cookies and things, you will also have personalized results based on your previous searches and things like that. So no, they will all give you different results based on their own database and their own programming. Um, things that are true <laughs> about search engines um, is that uh, the engine uses its own items. So that would be its own web crawlers, its own databases, its own algorithms are the main three there. But all you need to know is no, it's fake. Okay. How do you ensure your username for a site or service is not a duplicate? So back in the day, you would literally have like tables of everything next to you and you would have to manually do this, but computers do it now for you. So you don't have to do anything. You just put in the name you want and the setup program will tell you whether it's available. So it checks it automatically. It's not going to display everybody else's emails to you um, so that you can go through and pick something different. It's just going to tell you whether someone's already using that handle. Okay, all email addresses must contain blank, um, the at symbol. The at symbol separates the domain and the person's name. Okay, the at symbol. Back in the day, email was sent, it would be your person's name at the computer that you were using, but that's not how it is now. It's all on uh, domains with the uh, DNS system from the lecture. 
An email can be sent to more than one user at a time. Yes. So only one user at a time is false. You can send it to as many people as you like, essentially, um, using the CC, which is carbon copy, and the BCC feature, which is this one. When sending emails, what is a BCC? Well, it stands for blind carbon copy. And a carbon copy is just an old form of like kind of hand photocopying. You would write on something and it would imprint through the carbon paper onto another piece of paper. So you had this exact replica. So a carbon copy, you're just sending the same email. When you're emailing and you send copies, everyone who's in the to and the copy section can see the other email addresses and the other recipients. So you know, you know, this was copied to my coworker as well. They also have a copy. However, the BCC is secret. So when you send someone a letter, uh, an email and you copy them in the BCC section, the blind carbon copy, then the other people receiving that email are not going to be able to see the address of the recipient in the blind carbon copy. They're not even going to know there was anyone in that section. Okay. So this is a way to send things without people knowing of the recipient. So obviously there's dodgy uses for this. Think mean girls, three-way calling, um, the person that's pretending they're not there and they're listening in, same idea. Um, but you can use it for good. The main use of blind carbon copy for me is to protect privacy. If I'm sending out large, you know, an email to a large amount of people, I put everyone in the blind section. That way you can't reply all. So that saves that problem. And it also protects the privacy of um, all the people on the chain because their emails are not being shared. So, um, I already went through this. If you've done, uh, my example here is like old receipt papers and things, if you, or like if you've done um, credit cards where you use the machine and like rub it across, that's carbon paper and is making a carbon copy. So the answer here, recipient of the BCC receives a copy without anybody else knowing. So only the sender and the recipient know that they received it. When you save a draft email, dot, 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 question mark. <laughs> So when you save a draft, it saves a copy of the message so that you can edit it later. Okay. Um, that's it. So deep. Excuse me. So the email um, is saved and then you can go back, make changes and send it later um, without having to redo the entire thing. Outlook folders look work like file explorer folders, true or false. This is true. Okay. Um, and folders and uh, Gmail labels serve the same purpose. That's, I think, on the quiz, one of the quiz questions. Um, can you delete Gmail system labels? No, no, you can't. Um, but you can edit them. So um, you can uh, hide them, rename them, and add other labels underneath them, um, like a subdirectory, which is called populating. So they can be hidden, renamed, and populated, but they cannot be deleted. If you receive an email from someone you don't know and it has a link, delete it without opening it. Not even going over the other options, just get rid of it. If someone sends you a link and it's unsolicited, you either don't know them or you didn't ask for a link or you haven't heard from them forever and they send you something weird, assume that it's hacked, assume that it's malware, delete it unopened, okay? You can also use the report features to classify the email as either junk, spam, or phishing, um, depending on how much information you have about that email. What's a worm? So this is one of the types of malware, and it has three qualities that you need to know. So the first one, um, we talked about the quiz, re uh, quiz review. We will have gone over the different types of malware. So worms, trojans, viruses, and spyware, the four main types. So a worm does not attach to files, okay? So that's in, in opposition to the virus. Um, viruses attach to files. Worms do not. They don't need another files infrastructure in order to function. They run in, oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> they run in active memory and they don't require the human user to do anything in order for them to function. So they can function all on their own um, without your help. So the three things there does not attach to files, does not require user action, 
runs in active memory. And I've highlighted those ones for you, or well, bolded them. Is there a way to guarantee your computer will never be infected? No. <laughs> No, so there's lots of ways that you can protect yourself, um, but no, there's no way to guarantee it because the computer programs are updating all the time and changing all the time and getting better at getting around security and then security gets better at protecting and then the malware gets better at getting through. It's cycle, right? Um, and anytime you go on the internet, you know, it's always possible that you're going to click on a farmed link or you're going to get fished or um, you are going to click on something that has malware in it. And yeah, there's no way to guarantee it unless you either never turn your computer on or never plug it in to the internet. If you have no internet connection, you're not going to get malware. <laughs> After downloading and installing programs, you might have some unwanted software left or problematic software. What do you do? You are gonna run your uninstaller, okay? So anti-malware is your protection, okay? And then um, if it gets through the anti-malware and the firewall, then you run your uninstaller program to get rid of all of those files and it's, um, like malware bytes is gonna work. And I think one of the examples they give you is called Revo uninstaller, but they all work pretty much the same. And that is all of the questions. So I hope that this was helpful and clear. Um, and we will go over these answers together and you can ask me any of your questions in the review meeting. So please let me know if you do have any questions. Um, I look forward to chatting about it with you. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys later. All right, bye.